Welcome, everyone. On behalf of the UCLA Alan D. Levy Center for Jewish Studies, I'd like to welcome you to the Michael and Irene Ross Lecture in Yiddish Studies, featuring Professor Amelia Glazer of UC San Diego. The Levy Center would like to thank you for staying socially distant and intellectually engaged by participating in these virtual events. My name is Sam Spinner. I'm Assistant Professor of Yiddish at Johns Hopkins University. Professor Glazer and I will discuss her new book, Songs in Dark Times, Yiddish Poetry of Struggle from Scottsboro to Palestine, published by Harvard University Press in 2020. It's available through Harvard Press and wherever books are sold. Before we get to the book, a few words about Dr. Amelia Glazer, who is Associate Professor of Russian and Comparative Literature at UC San Diego and also currently directs the Jewish Studies and Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies programs. That's a lot. Professor Glazer is a scholar of Yiddish, Ukrainian, and Russian literature, and has published widely in all three areas. She's the author of Jews and Ukrainians in Russia's Literary Borderlands, published in 2012 by Northwestern University Press, and is the editor of Stories of Khmelnytsky, Competing Literary Legacies of Ukrainian Cossack Uprising, published by Stanford in 2015. She is also editor with Stephen Lee of Comintern Aesthetics, published in 2020 by the University of Toronto Press. She is also an accomplished translator of poetry. What I believe is her first book, Prolet Pen, America's Rebel Yiddish Poets, published in 2005, features translations of those remarkable poets. And though that collection came at the very beginning of her career, it is, I think, directly connected to her most recent book, which we're here to discuss today, entitled Songs in Dark Times, Yiddish Poetry of Struggle from Scottsboro to Palestine, again published by Harvard in 2020. One of the many wonderful things about this book is that it contains uh, in an appendix, a selection of translations of full poems making available to the reader some of these fascinating, moving and largely unknown poems. So Amelia, your book brings to light a group of poets, many of whom have been neglected who were engaged in a remarkable political and aesthetic project. These poets were deeply invested in internationalism. They were Jewish communists or fellow travelers who wrote poems to forge bonds of empathy and solidarity with non-Jewish ethnic and racial minorities around the world. As you argue and so compellingly show the way they did it, the keystone of their poetry was the use of what you call passwords. So to get started, can you tell us about one of these fascinating poets and give us a sense of how these passwords worked? Yeah, Sam, thank you so much for uh, for engaging me with me on this book because it's really uh, it's really a lot of fun to talk with you about it. Um, yeah, I've um, I've tried to introduce poems and poets that um, that readers won't know in this book, and some of the poets are better known than others. And I want to share with you first a, uh, a poet that's maybe a little better known, Hey Levick. Um, but before I do that, I'll, I'll just say that it's a, um, it's, it's what I've called a salvage literary history in the sense that I've, I've attempted to explain a poetic movement that has been largely unknown, largely neglected in English language studies. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm telling the story of poets who at various points in the long 1930s aligned themselves with the, uh, with the Communist Party and especially with communist internationalism. And this long decade begins in my project with 1927. Uh, 1927 was, uh, was the year of the Sacco Vansetti trial. And it was also a year that began uh, what was known as the third period in, uh, in the communist international, which brought with it all sorts of implications around who was considered to be a worker. And uh, this was a year of a hardline line 
turn when socialists were dismissed from um, from this idea of a of a workers international. Um, so it was a hardline year. It was the year of the beginning of what we might call hardline Stalinism, um, but it was also a year of uh, increasing awareness of groups outside of one's own group around the world. So it's a, it's a complicated period. Um, and I begin with 1927 and end in and around 1943, which was the official ending of the communist international by Stalin in the midst of World War II. Um, so I thought I'd, I'd open by sharing with you a poem that was written about Sacco and Vanzetti, the uh, Italian American anarchists who were put to death in Massachusetts um, for alleged murder, um, but it was a very political trial. And I'll go ahead and Sam, we talked about my, my going ahead and reading the whole poem for you to give a sense of what these poems sound like. Um, hey, Levick was not a Communist Party member, but he was writing very internationalist verse and he was publishing in party aligned venues. Um, so I'll read it for you first in English, and then I'll read at least part of it in Yiddish. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is called a Sako Vansetti year. In Yiddish, it is a Yo Sako Vansetti. You've cut into our memory like a hot knife in a wound. Oh, whom else could death have taken in such a sealed bond? Today, like last year, the hangman's feet dance the Charleston across the earth, Fuller's bite hasn't even been covered with a scab. The same evil from accuser to accuser, the same fist, the same power. Oh, we won't forget how the clock hand dripped with blood that August night. That night on the glowing stones, we all howled like tired wolves when they fell on us like falling bones. Those last moments of the 12th, at 12th hour. But that night we poured ointment too on prison locks, on bolts and chains, and the tortured victim became a bridegroom. And the bridal chair was the electric chair. From a just petition, from retribution, footsteps still echo, echo. How the sound sacco rings out like a bell and how Vansetti sizzles. Uh, so you can hear in my reading of that in English even that there's a lot of wordplay going on in this poem. And, uh, and perhaps you've, you've gotten a sense even from the English translation that Levick is moving between uh, language that is, uh, you know, that, that is uh, a bit, even a little bit biblical and, um, and also language that evokes the Italian of Sacco and Vansetti. Um, so I'll read just a bit of it in, in Yiddish perhaps, Sam. Um, yeah. Ihr habt eingeschnitten in unser Sikoren, wie ein ungeglitter Messer in der Wund. O wemmen noch ein Zoe, hat der Teut gekennt Porten in ein Saar versiegelten Bund. Heint, a Zoe wie Farajoren, Charlestonen, über der Erd, dem Taliensfies. Es ist noch a viele nicht verzeugen geworden, mit kein Heitel der Fullerischer Wies. Du selbe Schlecht von Kateger zu Kateger, der selbe Feust, die selbe Macht, o mir vergessen nicht die Weisers von Seger, wie sie haben getrifft mit Blut in Eugesnacht. So that's just the beginning of it, but I do have that poem and several others translated in full at the end of the book, um, the press. Um, I was very pleased, was, was happy to have me include an appendix with some full translations in it. Yeah, no, it's great. And the Yiddish is, is there together with the English, the Yiddish and transliteration. So um, it's great for comparison. And I think this is a, a great poem for us to start with because so much of what you write about in the book um, comes out here right away almost in the first line when Levick says, you've cut into our memory. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I think a, a lot of these poets, what they're trying to do and the particular challenge that, that takes so many different iterations is uh, create that hour that's not just about Yiddish speakers, about European Jews. Yeah, absolutely. So what I see Leifig doing here in this poem, and I'm, I'm actually gonna go ahead and share a, a short excerpt of it with you on, um, on the screen. Get my screen, there we go. Um, so 
there's the cover of the book, but um, I'll share just an excerpt of it with you. So it, it, it begins, this isn't the very beginning of the poem where I say, you know, you've cut into our memory like a hot knife in a wound, whom else could death have taken in such a sealed bond? Uh, there's, there's actually quite a lot going, going on there. There's a, there's a cut, right? There's a, almost a sort of a, you know, a circumcision or something that's happening. There's, a, there's a, a marking of a physical violent marking of collective memory that's happening. And, and our can be interpreted in various ways. Is our us Jews? or is our us workers, or is our us Americans? It's never clear, but there's a collective that's being formed and that collective is being formed in part around the, uh, the victims like Sacco and Bonsetti of uh, you know, potentially unjust uh, political system in the United States that would try, uh, that would try immigrants, that would try workers uh, without, without getting all of the facts, without a fair trial. And um, what really strikes me about this poem is the admission that's happening of, uh, of these two Italian anarchists and their Italianness is called attention to just in a very subtle way at the very end when he talks about their names. You know, right. Sacco rings out like a bell and Vanzetti, the name itself seems to sizzle. Um, uh, really kind of horrifying discussion of their, of their names. Um, the, um, these Italian anarchists, these Italian Americans who, you know, we, everyone knew at the time, uh, didn't even speak uh, wonderful English, particularly fluent English. There were these, uh, you know, these letters and, and quotes that were published by them in quite broken English, um, who are being in, admitted into a fold. So there's almost a, a pact, a bond that's being formed with, uh, with workers of the world. And they're, they're not Jewish, but they are the victim of the, um, the accuser. And we see that in this slide that I'm, that I'm sharing with you here, the same evil from accuser to accuser, the same fist, the same power. The word that, uh, that Levik chooses in Yiddish for accuser is kategel, which is the, uh, the Talmudic term. It actually comes from the Greek into Hebrew, kategor. Um, uh, and it's, the, it's just the term for the prosecutor originally in, uh, in biblical Hebrew, but it had made its way into Yiddish as a kind of uh, mystical figure, this um, prosecuting angel. By the time Leibach was writing, there were these Yiddish folk stories and folk poems that used this concept of the kategel as someone mystical who judges. This is a very Jewish concept um, that now is, is judging in an unfair way these Italian anarchists. And what I see happening in so many of the poems that were written in Yiddish by these left aligned Yiddish writers in, uh, in that period of the long 1930s is a, a reworking of uh, poetic tropes and of terms that are used to talk about the unjustice shown to Jews um, being expanded to discuss um, injustice that's shown to other groups. Right. And, you know, Kateger also evoking the, the Talmudic phrase, Ein Kateger nasa sanega, the prosecutor won't become a, uh, the defendant, Levik, reminding Jews, don't think that these people are going to be your friends. That's right. Um, and so it, it's a remarkable kind of um, polemic, but it's also a beautiful poem. Um, which brings me to, I guess, a, a big question um, about your book because it's about poetry, but it's also about politics. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just curious if you could speak generally about the ways in which in the long 1930s for these poets, poetry was um, the most immediate or most obvious or most necessary way to do the political work that they were doing. Um, and then a sort of related question is a, a line in your book that, that really um, struck me in your chapter on the, um, the conflict, the debate among uh, Yiddish poets, communist poets about events in Palestine in 1929 is when you ask, how did a story about Palestine become a story about poets? So there's a sort of complicated set of relationships between politics and poetry and poets and history. Um, 
And that's kind of a very broad, uh, vague question, but I, I wonder if you could lead us into some of the aspects of that that you talk about in the book. Yeah, I'd be so happy to. So I, I um, you mentioned when you were giving my the introduction to me that my my first book project that I, I did when I was still a graduate student was a, uh, a large translation project of the prolet pen poet. These were party aligned, not necessarily party members, but party aligned American Yiddish poets uh, who formed a, a, a union, a writer's union, prolet pen in 1929. And, uh, and this new project really emerges from those translations. You know, often when you, uh, when you do a project at one point, especially when you're very young as I was when I started that project, I was still sort of sorting out my own trajectory. I was sorting out what my dissertation would be about. My dissertation was about something totally different, but these, these uh, leftist Yiddish poets were sitting with me for you know, a good decade before I decided to return to them and, and write something about them. And what, what struck me about, the, a couple of different things struck me about them. First of all, they were, um, they were publishing in, uh, in small journals, small uh, you know, party aligned Yiddish literary journals. And they were also publishing on the pages of the Freiheit, the American ones, which was the, uh, the party aligned American communist Yiddish daily, which began publishing in 1922. And their poetry would kind of just illustrate the events of the day. So they were newspaper poets, in a sense. And the Freiheit, David Katz has, has made this point. He actually wrote the introduction to the Prolet Pen book that I translated back in 2005. Um, uh, and he makes this, this point as well. The Freiheit somehow had cornered the market on poetry in the American Yiddish literary scene. The Forwards, which is still going, the Forwards was the socialist aligned journal. They had the prose writers. They had fantastic pro write, prose writers. People like Shalom Ash at a certain point before he was thrown out, published in the, in the Forwards as did Bergelson, uh, who was living in Berlin and then eventually moved to the Soviet Union. Um, you had tons of wonderful prose writers uh, in, in the Forwards, but the Freiheit published poets. And poetry is a genre that lends itself to, um, to throwing in, inserting a slogan and not completely steering the, the poem off course. It can be written quickly. It can be read very quickly. And there was this idea that poetry as a, as a romantic genre, a genre with a tradition in romanticism could be turned and mobilized toward the cause. This was something that was going on in the Soviet Union as well. So I've focused on poets. And I focused on this idea of the poetic password. So these, uh, these poems that are built around terms um, that, that become important to the Yiddish writers. Uh, the, what these passwords do, words like katego, and there are other words that kind of admit other, other um, groups into a fold is they actually in, in some ways are um, enacting a, a sort of transubstantiation, a, a sort of conversion process whereby a, um, a writer who is an African-American or an Italian-American or a, you know, a Republican fighting against the fascists in Spain becomes Jewish in a sense. And it's not that they become Jewish, but it's that the Jewish fold broadens to encompass a new version of what us means. And what I see these poets doing in the 1930s is using their genre, using their literary genre to redefine what, you know, what we means, what us means. It's no longer uh, we Jews, but it is rather we workers of the world and new passwords needed to be established in order to, uh, you know, to, to have secret codes um, that, it, that, that imply meaning and belonging. To what degree was this, um, this effort at, at expanding uh, a community, to what degree was it sort of equally Jewish writers expanding their own identity, their own community outward? Um, and on the other hand, bringing in others into their own community. So uh, what I mean to say is that passwords, it seems to me can can operate in two directions. They work both ways. Yes, absolutely. Right. And this is something I, you know, I, I, I write about a lot in the book. Um, uh, so there, uh, there are a couple of 
two kinds of pa- there's two big kinds of passwords that I deal with in the book. One is these Jewish terms like katego or you know kaddish, um, or words that are drawn from other Jewish poems that had become markers of Jewish collective trauma that were used to apply to other groups. Um, one of those is you know this term, the the mound, which had become famous through a couple of pogrom poems and was then used to apply to other to other groups. Um, But the other kind of password is a password that's borrowed from other groups and brought in to these these Jewish poems. So uh, the poets who were writing about the Spanish Civil War, for example, wrote about no pasaran, used this this term no pasaran, which ironically means they shall not pass, they won't make it into Madrid. Um, But no pasaran meant we are fighting against uh, fascists in Spain. And no pasaran was the passphrase that was used by all sorts of um, of uh, you know inter- the members of the international brigades who were fighting in Spain, um, and this was was borrowed by the Yiddish poets. Uh, other terms were terms that evoked historical events. So I have a chapter that deals with Scottsboro and the Scottsboro trial of nine young black men uh, who were. Um, wrongly accused of raping two white women aboard a freight train in the, in the American South. Uh, and the, this was a trial that went on, began in the early 1930s, but went on for, um, for years. And simply by titling a poem Scottsboro, a Yiddish writer was saying, there is racism in America. <laughs> they didn't necessarily have to be talking about the Scottsboro trial, but it was a password that admitted themselves into that conversation about American racism and also brought African-Americans into a kind of Jewish fold. You know, we're, we are not concerned with, with pogroms right now and where we are now in the United States, we are concerned with lynchings, which in some ways is the same thing. So there are words that expands the community in various directions. And I can share, I don't know if it would be helpful, Sam, I, I do have a slide with the table of contents that I can just- Right, no, that that's great. Um, so obviously there are, in, in that long decade, there were a number of uh, around the world of, of urgent pressing um, global political matters and your chapters kind of um, deal with, with some of the big ones um, and also evoke uh, a kind of, or, or rather the, these subjects kind of generated a, a wide array of really interesting passwords. So Katega uh, is a fascinating one. Um, what are some of the other passwords? Um, I mean, there are obviously a, a lot that come up, but are there any that, that you would particularly want to talk about now? Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I'll just uh, say a couple of things about the table of contents since it's on the screen. And, uh, you know, as you mentioned, I, I tried to hit a few key uh, historical moments that were important to these writers in the 1930s. And of course, I didn't get to all of them because the book got long. Uh, but uh, I open with this uh, this introduction, which deals with the Sacco Vansetti trial and execution. Um, I then move on to a chapter that deals with Esther Schumacher, who was a poet uh, married to a very famous playwright and journalist, Paris Hirschbein, and the two of them together traveled the world. They traveled to every continent except Antarctica in the 1920s, and they um, some of their last stops were in East Asia. Uh, they traveled to China, India, Japan, and then after that made a 10-month stop in the nascent Soviet Union and were living actually on a, a farming colony in Crimea. And while she was living in Crimea, Esther Shumyacha wrote all of these poems about, uh, about China. She was editing, she was finishing her poems about East Asia and publishing them in Soviet venues. So she was a, you know, she was born in Eastern Europe, but she was raised in Canada and had this privileged life. She married very young. She married when she was about 20 or even a little bit younger. Um, and Hirschbein was a bit older. Uh, she had this privileged life throughout her 20s of traveling the entire world and writing about people. But she chose to write about uh, largely the workers and the lower classes that she saw and then published these poems in Soviet venues uh, in 1928. 
And uh, she would later drift away from the party fairly quickly. But some of her poems are interesting because she's using what I identify as passwords, or um, I might even say sort of past phrases from other Yiddish poems, Yiddish poems that had been written in the 19, the early 1900s. Uh, about uh, about pogroms, and she's kind of reworking those poetic motifs to apply them to the uh, the workers that she met when she was traveling in East Asia. Yeah. After that, but, I yeah, mm -hmm. I was just going to say let's let's get let's look at one of those poems yeah. or talk a little more closely once you get through the. Well, do you want to just walk through the rest no, of the? Great, I'll walk you through the table of contents and then we'll jump back to a poem yeah. that I that I've selected by Esther Schumacher, which I I find really kind of fun and also enigmatic. Um, fun is the wrong word that I find, you know, interesting and enigmatic. These, many of these, these poems are tragic. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the second chapter deals with um, 1929 in Palestine. There was a, uh, a series of a, a wave of violence in Palestine in late August, early September, 1929, beginning with conflict at the Western Wall and then spreading to Hebron and Tel Aviv and other parts of, uh, of British Mandate Palestine. And those, um, uh, the poems that I selected from that period are poems written by party aligned Jews who chose to welcome the violence uh, by Arabs in Palestine against Jews in Palestine as a form of revolution. And that chapter centers on a conflict that, that really splits apart the left in 29 over uh, over that violence. Was this violence something that was excusable as a form of revolution by a group that is being oppressed or was it a pogrom? And so that chapter deals with a couple of different terms that are being debated at that moment on the pages of Yiddish language journals far from Palestine. I, I then move on to Scottsboro and talk about these poems that are written about during the Scottsboro trial about anti-Black violence in the United States. Uh, chapter four is about the Spanish Civil War. And in that chapter, I deal with, uh, with a Soviet writer, Peretz Markish, an American writer, Aaron Quartz, and a Mexican writer, Jacobo Glantz, all of whom were writing about Spain and what was taking place in Spain without having actually visited. So they're, they're writing from the perspective of the, uh, the international brigades based on letters they were receiving, newspaper articles they were reading, and so forth. Um, and then the last two chapters of the book take a little bit of a turn because rather than focusing on um, uh, shifting from Jewish trauma to other groups trauma, these last two chapters highlight um, the ways that passwords are become a way of, of talking about Jewish trauma again in the late 1930s as World War II is beginning. Um, chapter five is about the, uh, the Soviet Yiddish writer and translator, David Hofstein, who writes about uh, the Ukrainian romantic poet, Taras Shevchenko, and, and actually finds ways in his translations of this Ukrainian romantic poet to talk about the suppression of Jewish culture in the Soviet Union. So he's actually using, using internationalism to reinsert Jewish concerns into a Soviet space where Jewish concerns had started to disappear. Um, and then finally, I turn to these, uh, these writers focusing on one writer, Moisha Nadir, who after the Hitler-Stalin pact left the party and in fact also left um, internationalism as a concept and started about, really, really did a kind of return conversion to writing about, uh, about Jewish concerns again. And, uh, and Jewish trauma. And Moshe Nadir, in the last years of his life, shifted from being a really, you know, Fabrental, you know, a really a flag waving communist party aligned poet, to apologizing for his years aligned with the party and, uh, and started to write about, um, about God, about uh, Jewish community concerns. You know, I, I don't think he was going to synagogue. I don't think he was, you know, becoming observant in any way, but he was writing about Jewishness again in a way that he hadn't for a couple of decades. Uh, so there, there is this retreat into particularism that takes place at the end of this period that I'm discussing. And I, I attempt to address that gradually as I go through the chapters.
And uh, the afterword is also, it's, it's shorter, but I think it's no less uh, significant um, to, to your argument pointing kind of after and, and beyond this, this period from before the Holocaust that most of your book deals with. Um, and Kaddish in, in a way is, is perhaps the most legible of the, of the passwords um, that you write about. But let's get back to Esther Shumiacher, who is um, of the many, many fascinating uh, and incredible characters in your book, um, many of whom have been, uh, you know, unfortunately neglected. Shumiacher is one of them. She, to me, she is one of the most fascinating, um, in part simply by the sort of biographical factoid that she belongs to a, a Canadian Jewish family who owned the, the hat company that makes the iconic white cowboy hat of the Calgary Rodeo. Um, but more to the point for our purposes, uh, hosted by UCLA, although I'm in Baltimore and you're in San Diego, uh, Esther Schumiacher and her husband, Peretz Hirschbein, settled in Los Angeles. Uh, so they were, uh, we can say with confidence, among the most distinguished uh, Los Angelino Yiddish poets and writers. Yeah, absolutely. And and Hirschbein was actually, you know, writing scripts for movies at a certain point. They were very much involved in in Los Angeles culture, Los Angeles artistic culture. Um, and Shumiacher taught in Yiddish schools when she was there. She continued to write throughout her life. She outlived uh, uh, Peretz Hirschbein by by a couple of decades. Um, so this poem, uh, this is just an excerpt that I've put up on the slide, but it gives you a little bit of a sense of how she was fashioning herself. She had been through, you know, this decade of travels, which was unheard of at this point. And this is a, um, this is a woman who was born in Gomel, uh, which was the site of a, of a horrible pogrom in the following Kishinev, just a few months following Kishinev in, uh, in, uh, the early 1900s, and she um, immigrated to Canada, and it actually worked in a meatpacking factory at a certain point, and as a waitress. So she was she was of the working class, although her family would eventually work its way up and become quite successful in Canada, and she herself would um, would have incredible privilege for, uh, you know, for for someone uh, living in uh, in uh, speaking as a Yiddish speaker living in the 1920s and 30s. Um, so she she writes this poem and publishes it in the Soviet Yiddish journal Reute Welt or Red World, which is a venue where a lot of a lot of Yiddish writers, mostly Soviet Yiddish writers, were writing about internationalism. They were they were trying to define on the pages of that journal what a workers international might look like, and they were privileging pieces that were about other groups. Um, so it was a you know ethnic diversity is what they were getting at, but in Yiddish and for Yiddish language readers. Uh, so she writes here, and this is just an excerpt. I've sown my days in wanderings from the broad shores of the Yangtze to the Ganges. I have sought in dark eyes a familiar interpretation and recognized in those eyes the sound of the hammer and sickle. Um, so she's kind of you know she's suggesting here that she uh, you know that she identifies you know through the dark eyes. She identifies with the people that she's seeing, with other marginalized individuals around the world, and that the unifying symbol is the hammer and sickle. Um, and she's, you know, she's writing this for a Soviet venue, but she's, uh, you know, she, she's really quite, she seems to be quite convinced of it in her poetry of the late 1920s. Um, and one of the poems that I uh, that I publish in the in the afterword to the sorry the appendix to the book um, in full is a poem called "At the Border of China and India" by Ram by Rand Punhina, Unind. And I don't know, is there Sam? Is there time for me to read some of that poem as well? Yeah, for sure. Into it, okay. I'll go ahead and read that in in English. Um, and this is a poem that. Shumiacher wrote about women that she uh, that she observed in this borderland between China and India. Wife and mother at the border of China and India, baskets hang from your shoulders laden with sadness and toil. Your breasts hang barren as empty leather flasks in the dazzle of parched waste. And the rotten wreckage wraps your meager body on your lips glows a sealed curse. Wife and mother at the border of China and India, your barefoot steps swarm, bound to their eternal trial on burning sand. You, you load your days on the bottom of the ship, 
along with the coal black dust. Your youth is consumed by the flame of this dark privilege, sorry, dark pillage. A faint song trickles from eyes lined with a sickly red. We crave and await death's rest. Wife and mother, over my head hang clear blue heavens. The fullness swings on ears of corn before the harvest. The dew hovers sadly over life, my heart, at the border of China and India. Lives swarm on a mound of trash. Whistle me a song in the wind in the void. Homeless hands find a home in the gutter. Hunger has ruined a crumb of a body. Here on the trash heap, sorrow has grown. Somebody's life is bound to expire. Whoever has sinned against these hands, he has plucked and dishonored this life. So I'll just uh, highlight a couple of those lines for you in Yiddish. Um, so this part where uh, she's talking about the trash heap, here on the trash heap, sorrow has grown. Hotzich delve often mistbar gemert, embitzens leben is oisgein beschelt. She evokes this trash heap, which is something that had become a passphrase for uh, for revolutionaries and also in Jewish pogrom poetry. Of course, there's the um, you know this idea of the Svalky story that uh, that Trotsky talks about the ash heap of history to which you know all of the the rubbish of the past would be relegated. But you also have writers like Peretz Markish, who in his very famous uh, Civil War pogrom poem Die Kuppe from 1920. Um, writes about, 2021, uh, writes about a mound of Jewish bodies that is piled in, the, in, a, in a shtetl on the market square in the aftermath of a pogrom. And, uh, and so I view, uh, I view Esther Schumacher, who was a friend of Markish's, as returning to this image of the pogrom poem, um, but writing about it in, in terms of these women, these, these, uh, these downtrodden, very, very poor women in China that she observed very much from a distance in her travels. Yeah, I think that, um, that this particular kind of um, turning around of that, that core pogrom theme is, is quite distinct here. Could you talk a little bit more about that background of pogrom poetry? Because behind Shumiacher and behind um, Peretz Markesh, as you write about in the book, is Bialik. Bialik. Um, and, and that's sort of hugely important, but I think also highlights the political shift uh, that happens here with, with this particular password that expands beyond this chapter and, and kind of pops up again and again. Yeah, I'll go ahead. And, um, this is just at the very beginning of In the City of Slaughter. Chaim Nachman Bialik had written In the City of Slaughter in the wake of the Kishinev pogrom in 1903. And uh, he actually traveled to Kishinev. He, he wrote this poetic reportage of the horrific you know, event that killed you know, nearly 50 people. And, uh, and Kishinev became the rallying cry around the world um, to come to the aid of Jews who were the victims of pogroms in Eastern Europe. But it was also a poem that changed modernism. It, um, you know, the language he uses is, is very harsh. He's talking about you know, this horrific violence against Jews that had taken place, but he's admonishing Jews for not standing up and leaving. And in fact, the poem famously ends with a cry to East European Jews to get up and flee to the desert. Uh, so here we, you know, we have on, on in the very beginning of this poem, arise and go now to the city of slaughter into its courtyards, wind thy way there with thine own hand touch and with the eyes of thine head, behold on tree, on stone, on fence, on mural clay, the splat, the spattered blood and dried brains of the dead. I mean, it's, 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 it's horrible, it's heart-wrenching. And he goes on to talk about a mound of bodies that's piled and there's a Jew together with a dog on this pile. Um, and that becomes the image of the pogrom. And so what, you know, what people like Bialik did, and Bialik is really, can really be credited with in some ways inventing a modernist form, is to uh, use a, um, a, you know, a new appreciation of, of creativity around language to show how horrific this anti-Jewish violence could be. 
And much of, of Yiddish, as well as Hebrew poetry, Bialik wrote this in Hebrew, um, Yiddish and Hebrew poetry was in the 1900s and 1910s, really into the 1920s, was poetry about violence, about, tr about collective trauma that was processing this collective trauma. There were even more horrific pogroms that took even more lives during the Ukrainian Civil War of 1918 to 1920. Um, and a genre was born, a really, a really tragic genre, um, but a genre that was playing with language nonetheless. What I see the poets in the late 1920s through the 1930s doing was to take that focus on national mourning and write poems that were in, in the same genre, but about other groups. Yeah. So it wasn't that there was that much new uh, formal experimentation that was happening in the 30s. In some ways, the 30s was much more focused on politics than on form, in Yiddish poetry at least. But there was, uh, there was such extreme political experimentation that these, uh, this idea of collective suffering was, uh, was translocated, I use this term in the book, to write about other suffering groups. And, and Shumiachar, I think, is a nice example. She was friends with Bialik also, by the way. They, right. they were in Palestine, they hung out with Bialik. They, there are letters between Hirschbein and Bialik um, from their, their visit to Palestine. Yeah, um, but what's so striking here though, and, and why this is such a great example, is that it shows, first of all, the sort of uh, poetic inevitability of using what Bialik had, had kind of so um, innovatively set out, um, both a, as a sort of kind of um, aesthetic uh, toolkit, but also as a political imperative, but Shumiacher turns it around. Um, and one of the things that's so um, notable about, about so many of these poems, and certainly this one, is that turning of perspective away from the Jewish perspective to forging those bonds of empathy um, with, with Shumiacher kind of, most of the poem is really about describing what she sees and kind of counting on this emotional resonance, a kind of human, a natural human response. And with the password there, kind of just at a key juncture, um, linking it into the sort of Jewish poetic political resonance. So there really is a kind of um, a moving um, demonstration of empathy here. But there's also a kind of um, flattening in a way, um, a certain exoticizing that Shumiachar uses that is, is complicated in the way that it mixes a kind of human empathy, but also a, a turning um, you know, these non-Western groups into an example of what we Westerners need to do. So it, it raises questions, I think, about, about exoticization in, and exoticism in, um, in Jewish poetry in this period in general, but in Shumiatra's work. Also about, you know, an anachronistic term, um, appropriation, cultural appropriation for a political project. Um, but then more broadly about the kind of balancing acts of identity that these poets had to had to deal with. Yeah, I mean, Shumiatra is a fun example and, and our colleague Faith Jones has written a little bit about this and Shumiatra as well. She was heavily criticized yeah. for her first book. It came out in, uh, in 1929, 1930 uh, uh, in the Hours of Love and Schoen von Liebschaft. And it was, it was really kind of raked over the coals and you had all of these very prominent critics accusing her of, of exoticizing. And, you know, I think Melich Ravitch wrote a, uh, a review titled, uh, I think it was a Western woman or maybe even a Jewish woman views the East from behind a veil or something, right? Like, you know, kind of using her gender, but also um, just saying, you know, Shumiatra, you didn't really get, get up close to these people. You know, yeah. you're just looking at them through whatever haze you want to see them through. And they weren't wrong. I mean, she was exoticizing them, but I see in her poetry enough um, self-consciousness about the possibility of um, the Jew also being exoticized, that it becomes very interesting for that relationship, um, for that view of a kind of intersection between a, a, a Jewish subject who is starting to recognize her own privilege, particularly as, a, as an immigrant in North America, 
um, and a, uh, you know, and a subject who is um, not fully, uh, certainly not fully aware of the communities that she's writing about, but wants to describe them nonetheless. Mm -hmm. So it's, there's this very fine line that she treads. I believe that much of the criticism she got was veiled criticism of her party alignment. I think that, you know, part of what they were saying was, you know, party aligned poets are exoticizing other groups and, you know, should be writing about things they know. And I, you know, I'd like to take them to task for that. And I try to do that a little bit in this book, um, because I think that these, you know, these writers were trying to do something innovative and they were trying to reach out um, as Jews and write about others. I, you had mentioned um, the, you had, you had brought up the Bialik and this might be a good point to turn to another reworking of Bialik, just to mm -hmm. talk a little bit about the Palestine. Would this be a good moment to bring in the TAFE poem? Absolutely. I, and I was going to, I was going to ask you right now to, to talk about the, the Palestine chapter. Um, yeah, I mean, Palestine is, is a big uh, moment in, uh, in the history of the Jewish left. And when I say Palestine, I'm not talking about the whole history of Palestine, but 1929 in Palestine, which is what I'm writing about here. Uh, and that the chapter on Palestine is a chapter really um, not so much about Jewish writers who are uh, who are writing about Arabs and you know trying to figure out how to talk about Arabs. It's partly that, but they're leftist Jewish writers who are um, who are uh, well. <laughs> there are Stalinist aligned leftist Jewish writers and anti-Stalinist aligned leftist Jewish writers who are writing about one another right. and about the rift within the community. What does it mean to align oneself fully with a political cause? that tells you, you know, what, what you're supposed to believe and um, what does it mean to, to tear yourself away from this? Um, so I'll, maybe I'll, I'll just open this <laughs> little mini discussion with, uh, with a reading of part of the Moisha Tafe poem that I include. So I mentioned Chaim Nachman Bialik and In the City of Slaughter. Sorry, and, before, <laughs> yeah. sorry before you start reading the poem, um, if you could just kind of give a like a, 10 second capsule history of what these poets are responding to. Yeah, what are they responding to? Thank you. Um, so August, 1929, there was a wave of violence. It started in, uh, started around the Western Wall and uh, in, an, I think it was August 23rd and gradually this violence spread throughout Mandate Palestine. So it, you know, it erupted with this sort of, you know, these, these, um, you know, these, these small skirmishes in Jerusalem. Uh, there was a, a massacre that took place in Hebron where a, um, a group of, of rioters ended up killing uh, a lot of innocent Jews, including um, elderly people, uh, yeshiva boys. Um, uh, and, um, and then it spread throughout Palestine. And um, the, there ended up being about 200 deaths on we'll say both sides, if you want to call it sides, um, Arab deaths and Jewish deaths. Uh, the Jewish deaths were largely Jews that were killed by these, these groups that were, you know, you know, rising up against the, um, against the British authorities and against their Jewish collaborators. The Arab deaths tended to be victims of um, people in uniform, of uh, either British officers or Jewish um, members of the armed forces. And uh, what the way that the the international press responded to these events was first by, you know, it was there's sort of universal outrage on the first day after, especially the Hebron uh, portion of these of these violent events. Um, almost all of the Yiddish language journals called it a pogrom and condemned it as such. You know, this is a horrible event. Jews are being massacred in Palestine, uh, and. After a couple of days, the authorities, the Communist Party authorities at the Communist International said, actually, this should be looked at more carefully. The, uh, the Arab masses are expressing their frustration with the British imperial presence and with the Jewish collaborators, and we should consider this an uprising. And, um, and slowly you start to see Yiddish journals who remain party aligned roll back their initial response and change it from pogrom to uprising. Uh, several 
prominent Yiddish writers left the American party aligned Freiheit over these events. Hey, Levick, um, whose Sacco Vansetti poem I just read to you was one of them. He was one of the leaders of the Exodus in 1929 from the Freiheit. And he, together with a couple of others, formed a splinter journal called Voch. Voch was a weekly journal, a weekly long form literary journal. Um, many of their editorials were devoted to this Palestine issue. It was really a venue for the former communists to talk about uh, the problems of the communist party having just left. And Voch was a very welcome uh, you know, innovation for many of these, of these writers. Esther Schumacher and Peretz Hirschbein, for example, were absolutely distraught. They were still traveling. They were still in Eastern Europe when all of this happened. They were in Warsaw and, uh, you know, Nachman Meisel has a piece that he publishes in Literarische Blätter where he talks about this despondent Hirschbein who, who was depressed and he was just lying on the couch for, you know, weeks on end and Esther Schumacher didn't know what to do with him. And finally, Voch came out and, you know, he sort of had a little life in him again because he felt like he could still be a leftist but didn't have to align himself with the party anymore. But it was a gateway to becoming an anti-communist. So, so some of these writers left the party completely. Others actually returned to the party aligned uh, venues a couple of years later, including Hey Levick, uh, amidst the, uh, the racism, the, the mass racism around Scottsboro. Right. There was a gradual return, although those writers that briefly returned to the Freiheit uh, left for good almost all of them left for good uh, with the Hitler-Stalin Pact in 1939. Right. And that's the sort of brief overview of what took place right. in, in 29. But what's amazing is that in 29, this, you know, at, after a sort of brief period of indeterminacy, when the pogrom gets reclassified as uprising, that becomes a kind of litmus test that immediately shatters this poetic community. Yes, yes, absolutely. And, and it, it was over words. Right? Is it a pogrom or is it an uprising? And you know, it was very much a, a terminological. But those words are huge. <laughs> you know, I don't want to say it's just words because calling something a pogrom or calling it an uprising, it's the opposite. It's aligning yourself with the victims or the perpetrators of an event. And those who left the Freiheit were not willing to align themselves with the perpetrators of that particular violence. Ultimately, being a Jew trumped being a, an internationalist revolutionary. For those right. who left. Um, and for others who stayed, it was about being a revolutionary. It was about, it was, that was their final test. If they were willing to stay with the Communist International over those events, they had proved themselves uh, committed to that new version of we. Right. And this is probably the most striking kind of demarcation of the limits of internationalism, I think, in, in your book. Um, mm -hmm. And it's also revealed by the, the sort of intense passion of this debate and the, the anger and, and emotion that it precipitated, um, which is also kind of striking in its political purity, if you will, in comparison to Schumacher's poems. So like you said, in introducing this, there isn't any kind of appropriation or exoticism. There's, there's no depiction of Arabs or Arab culture in an effort to, um, to kind of build up that culture as an authentic or preferable alternative to not much, not much. There, I mean, there are little thin attempts, and I, you know, this was really, uh, it, it was actually a really interesting process researching this chapter. I basically just ordered all the Yiddish journals I possibly could get on microfilm. I was on, um, I was on family leave after the birth of my daughter when I was writing this chapter. So I was sitting there, you know, in the UCSD library, sometimes with a sleeping infant at my feet, going through really day by day, imagining that I was like in 1929 reading these, these newspapers. And I went through you know, obviously the whole fry height, but I also did my best to go through Tog, and uh, which is kind of the centrist populist uh, Yiddish, American Yiddish daily and forwards. Um, and I also went through um, Emis, which is the Soviet Yiddish daily. And Emis is a kind of, you know, it's the Yiddish response to Pravda. Uh, Emis doesn't have as many literary things in it. They would sometimes publish a poem, but not as many, but even Emis, uh, called it a pogrom slightly longer than Freiheit. It was the American Yiddish communist venue that switched first. 
And, you know, part of it, I think, was that Americans were just, you know, uh, very eager to prove their allegiance, these American communist members. Um, but I think part of it was also this, um, uh, there was a little more willingness to be internationalist. There was a little more assimilation in the United States mm -hmm. than there was among East European Jews. Right. Um, and that's a really interesting kind of twist. So you actually see some Soviet Jews publishing in the Freiheit about what was going on in Palestine because that was where all of these conversations were happening. So for example, Moisha Taif, who was 25 years old at the time, sent this poem. I've never found it in any of his collections or in any Soviet venues. Um, he sent this, this poem, which is based on the Chaim Nachman Bialik poem from 1903 in the city of Slaughter to the Freiheit, published it there. And it's turning in the city of Slaughter inside out. So he says, woe to the holy home, a city of slaughter, woe to the holy resting places, a bloody sacrificial altar. No one has anointed you, you are uninvited guests. He picks up where Bialik left off, sending the, the Jews who had been victims of pogroms off to the desert to find a better place to live and accuses them of becoming essentially pogrom chicks or aligned with pogrom chicks. Um, so you have a lot of poems at the time that are uh, taking, you know, really kind of doubling down on taking these modernist poems of trauma and turning them inside out. It's no longer just about uh, other victims. It's about Jews being perpetrators when we're talking about Palestine. And you can see where this rift really opened up. Yeah. Um. So the, um, let's talk a little bit now about the, your chapter about the Spanish Civil War, um, which is um, I, one of the sort of, so, there's so many, fat, I mean, each one of these chapters is really a, a compelling um, story. The way you tell it kind of brings together the literary history and also close readings of the poems and a really uh, convincing um, and almost fast-paced way. Your, your book is a real page turner, which is a breath of fresh air in literary studies. Um, yeah. And uh, and so there, there are always so many little um, things that jump out at me. And one of the things that I, I had never really thought about, um, partially because I guess I don't I don't work on on political uh, poetry or literature so much, um, but also because you know again as I've mentioned, so much of this of the poetry that you talk about. Is is unknown. Um, like you said, that Moshe Tafe poem has not been collected anywhere, um, and you really need to actually sit down and and pour through microfilms. Um, and so it's it's kind of, you know, I'm I'm grateful that you've done that work of of literary salvage, kind of um, bringing out and finding these poems and bringing them back to us. Um, and it's an opportunity to learn about some not just neglected figures neglected poems, but entire genres of poetry that actually, as you show, were really central genres um, for the Yiddish literary scene in that period. So we've talked a little bit about the newspaper poems, um, but you also talk uh, elsewhere about placard poems, um, which, which I like very much. Um, and you talk about placard poems by another fascinating figure uh, in your book, who I think we should talk a little bit about. Uh, a poet called Quartz. So what's a placard poem and who is Quartz? Yeah, so I don't think I have any placard poems on my on my slides, but we can talk a little bit about it. Yeah, so the Spanish Civil War, I mean, just a fascinating moment in, in poetry and, you know, you, uh, you know, Carrie Nelson and others who work in the American literary left have written a lot about English language uh, writing about the Spanish Civil War. Um, Alan Wald, uh, others have, have, have done a lot for a lot of the groundwork for understanding what genre these uh, these poems fit into. Um, the Spanish Civil War poetry was was an interesting genre because it it was it came at a moment when poets were experimenting with uh, with these found objects. So uh, letters, postcards would, would um, either be reworked into a poem or would, they would be cited in a poem. And then you also had these placards that were put up in Spain um, or placards that were sort of, you know, you, you had leaflets that were dropped over Spain and there were a lot of um, 
of uh, slogans that were used, uh, you know, we'll, we'll make it to Madrid and or that we won't let them get into Madrid and so forth. And these were all being, being placed into uh, the poems themselves as a new formal, as, as a formal genre of, uh, of, of revolution. And, you know, if we look at English language poems, we see things like, um, uh, Langston Hughes has some very famous postcard poems from Spain that he writes about, and Hughes actually went to Spain. Uh, but the poets that I write about uh, didn't go to Spain. One of them is Peretz Markish, and he has this long, this book called Spania, and it's been generally written off in the past. And these are accessible. These aren't things that, that I was digging out of newspapers. They're, they're books. Um, so you can go out and you can read, you can find it on microfilm and you can read Spania. But it's been mostly written off as something that Markish wrote in his period of very programmatic writing when he just wrote what he had to write for the Soviet Union. He'd, he'd made his home in the Soviet Union at that point, and he had to write stuff about what was going on. Um, and I, you know, I sat down with it and, and read it more closely. And yes, he has a lot of slogans. He's citing, uh, you know, La Passionaria, uh, who was this very important speaker in Spain at the time, and, you know, things that she would say in her speeches, like, um, you know, better to be the you know, the widows of heroes than the wives of cowards or, you know, various things like this, they would all find their way into poems. Um, but in between, and even including some of these slogans, the Spain poems are doing, are doing some really interesting things. And one of the things that uh, Peretz Markish does is to return to the, uh, the collective Jewish memory of the Inquisition and map this this collective response to the Inquisition onto uh, the internationalist response to uh, the fascist, uh, the, the fascist rebels, the, the fight against the fascist rebels in Spain. And so he's putting the two together. We internationalists, we communists have to fight this fascist because it's essentially we're able to go back in time and fight against the Inquisition. Uh, you have the same thing happening in, in the poetry of Jacobo Glantz, who was writing in Mexico, uh, having emigrated from Eastern Europe to Mexico. Uh, but he is in a, in, a, um, in a milieu where a lot more was being written about Spain than anywhere else. Mexico was actually sending aid to Spain at the time. There was a lot in the public imagination about Spain. And, uh, and Glantz as well, he has these images of um, the the bones of the great, great grandparents rising up and fighting together with the international brigade against the fascists. Um, and then you have Quartz and he's the third person that I write about in the Spanish Civil War chapter. He has a poem called Col Nidre, definitely a, a password drawn from Jewish, uh, from Jewish liturgy, from the, the you know, opening prayer on Yom Kippur. And he, uh, he writes about, I mean, just in this little excerpt, and Pedro of Madrid and Johannes of Hamburg helped the Spanish Jews, helped sing the Spanish Jews prayer sung by his grandson, David of Lemberg. So he has this sort of this story that unfolds in his poem about a, uh, you know, the, the progeny, the descendant of a, uh, of a Spanish Jew who had been a victim of the Inquisition coming back from Poland to fight in the Spanish Civil War. And he's with a whole community that effectively makes up his, his minion. And these are these non-Jewish internationalist fighters in the trenches with him. And they're singing the Kol Nidre together. And he actually opens this poem with a Yiddish translation of the opening lines of the Kol Nidre. Um, so he's, he's, you know, taking that collective memory of the, you know, of the, of the most um, well-known sort and putting it into his Spanish Civil War poem. Yeah, that's fascinating. And the, the sort of gesture, the, whether it's um, strictly ideological about translating Kol Nidre into Yiddish, um, or practical is, is, is still a fascinating one. Um, but this transfer of collective memory from the past uh, into the present is, is obviously one of the sort of central um, chronological and, and poetic moves of, of password poetry. Um, and in the Spanish Civil War chapter, you, you make a very interesting comment um, of all the various um, sort of moments, historical moments and thematics that you write about, pogroms, lynchings, uh, and so on. 
The, the one that you say offers a crucial context for the literature of trauma associated with the Holocaust is the Yiddish poetry of the Spanish Civil War. Um, and that's absolutely fascinating um, in large part because it's, it's unexpected, but in the way you present it, of course, it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, so even though you know, your book is, is about um, poetry from before the Holocaust, um, there are moments, including this one, where you, where you point to after the Holocaust. So I wonder if you could talk about, um, you know, you can choose how much, because these are, these are big questions, but two sort of um, moments from after the Holocaust. One would be the poetic resonance of this group of internationalist password poetry for poetry of the Holocaust, poetry written both during and in the aftermath of the Holocaust. Um, and then the other one would be uh, bringing things more to our contemporary moment. At various places in the book, uh, you point toward certain aspects of the uh, political and I guess affective agenda of these poets as offering food for thought or maybe even models for thought um, for negotiating questions of identity, politics um, in, in the contemporary period. So yeah. those are two big things. Um, Thank you. Yeah, and I know we, 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 I wanna be mindful of time as well. So I think that's, that's actually a really nice segue to um, how, I, how I end the study. And um, the, I, I see it as an inevitable tragedy that this turn outward towards other groups would end up turning back inward with the Holocaust, with World War II. Um, and, you know, you still have writers, and in fact, you know, the, the Spanish Civil War connection to the Holocaust, I find really fascinating and much more could be done on this. But Peretz Markus, for example, references the Spanish Civil War again when he's writing about the Holocaust in his later work, uh, because of course this was the first, you know, major war, internationally fought war against fascism in Europe. And, you know, who knows what would have happened had uh, the international brigades together with the Spanish Republicans won in Spain. Um, but uh, I, I end with this turn back towards the Jewish community. There had been this mass outward turn, this, this uh, you know, desire to think beyond Jewish provincialism beyond Jewish collective suffering to think about the suffering of others. And, um, and it's a beautiful moment, even for its party alignment. And I, I want to be very careful not to, to romanticize the, the party alignment. There was, um, you know, Stalin was a, you know, was a horrific character. He was horrific to the Jews. Um, a, a large number of Jews died at Stalin's hand, including many of the writers that I discuss, you know, Hofstein, Markish, and others in 1952 in the night of the murdered Yiddish poets. Um, but uh, what we see in this very idealistic writing in the 1930s is a history of Jewish thought around trauma that, that, that shows a large group of people with a very, very strong desire to connect their own collective suffering to the suffering of others. Right. And it's a history that I think needs to be drawn upon as Jews today attempt to sort out where Jewish studies can fit together with ethnic studies and you know, with the, the various you know, genocides and traumas that have gone on around the world. Uh, UCLA's Michael Rothberg has done really wonderful work on Holocaust studies and post-colonial studies um, in, in this department. Um, and I, you know, I see this as offering a kind of, a kind of prehistory uh, to Jews who are grappling with post-colonialism and trying to apply Holocaust studies to that. What you see with World War II is a number of these writers um, feeling the imperative of returning to write about their own community, because what else can you write about at that point? You know, your family members, your, you know, the, the place where you were born is, is being utterly annihilated. And um, most of the writers that I discuss by 1939 already have at least one foot out the door um, and are leaving the fry height, but not all of them. Others would stay with the, uh, with the Yiddish press until it became clear what had happened in 1952, until Stalin's atrocities became clear and we would gradually make an exodus at that point. An example is Alexander Pomerantz, who was one of the founders of the Prolet Pen movement. Uh, he, uh, 
was he actually went to Kiev and wrote his doctoral dissertation in 1935 under the Soviet, uh, you know, the Soviet philologist Max Erich. Max Erich was later killed under Stalin and um, and Pomerantz found out about it much later than that. In the 1940s, he was still writing things, you know, hailing the Soviet Union, but by the time it became clear what had happened in the Soviet Union, he wrote this, this martyrology of the Soviet Yiddish writers. And so you have, you know, you have a number of people doing that. Moisha Nadir, after 1939, writes not only all of these poems that are sort of poems of tshuva, poems of return to Jewishness, but he writes letters, personal letters to individuals that he had offended, especially during 1929. You know, he had written, you know, horrible things about the people that left the Freiheit, especially Leivik in 1929. And in the wake of the Hitler-Stalin pact, I, I found in, in Moshe Nadir's archive, which is now in Jerusalem for idiosyncratic reasons, I found these, these letters between Levick and Nadir where Levick is apologizing and Nadir's like, don't worry about it. We've, you know, we were in a moment, we were having a moment. They're still a little cold to one another, but there's this, you know, there's this attempt. The other way around, Nadir is apologizing. Yeah, Nadir is apologizing to Levick. Did I say the other way? Nadir yeah. is writing these apology letters to Levick and Levick is saying, it's, you know, and what, what struck me, if I recall correctly, is that Nadir uses the informal do yes. and Levick responds with the formal ear. Like, I Le get it. Keeps a little bit of a wall up. Yeah. Yes, yes. Levick isn't quite ready to, you know, to just hug and kiss. Um, but he does accept the apology. And he says, you know, something, I think the, the phrase is the ich trod nicht kein kass, right? I don't, I don't have any, um, I, don't, I don't carry my anger against you. Uh, and he even, other people are also writing to Levick at this point, sort of apologizing. Pomerantz is one of them, and Levick tries to help find Pomerantz a job at one point. Um, so, you know, there, there is an attempt to make amends, and that's part of what this return is. Uh, but, you know, you do have some writers who stay with the party and who try to find ways of integrating Holocaust memory with a continued commitment to other communities, to non-Jewish communities. And the most enigmatic example of this to me is Aaron Kortz, who, you know, I just shared with you his Kol Nidre, but he, Kortz, you know, Kortz stayed with the party until he died in the 60s. He wrote a birthday poem to Stalin in 1949. I mean, he was like, he was really a flag waver. Would he have remained as, you know, as much a believer if he'd been in the Soviet Union? Probably not, but he's a really, he's a fascinating story. He was born into a Hasidic family, a Lubavitcher Hasidic family in Vitebsk and ran away from home when he was a teenager to join the circus. Uh, he eventually found his way to the United States, uh, became a communist in the 1920s, very early in the American Communist Party. He was writing this experimental poetry in the 20s, and he was one of the first to join the Freiheit. He would later become the president of the Prolet Pen Writers Movement. But Kurtz ends up writing these, these rather thoughtful poems in the 60s during the civil rights era. And these are poems that integrate Holocaust memory with commemoration with the black of the black victims of, uh, of racism. So this might be a, a, you know, a good one to, to end on, um, Kaddish, which he writes in 1963. And this is a poem that he writes in commemoration of the four young black girls who are killed in a church bombing. And, uh, and it's a, it's a very long poem. I translate it in full at the end of the book. So you're welcome to read it that way. But I'll just read a little piece of it here uh, in English and then in Yiddish. Yiskadal ve Yiskadash, face to face with Abe Lincoln, face to face with the Negro martyred people. A rabbi says Kaddish. I am not a Kaddish sayer, but today mamas the world over bitterly wept and mourned the four little black girls. I responded to the rabbi's Kaddish, Omein. I'll read this in, in Yiddish. Yiskadal vi Yiskadash, ponem al ponem mit Abe Lincoln, ponem al ponem mit dem negelschen Martyrer folk, zog darov Kaddish, ich bin nicht kein Kaddish zoger, nor die Mamas über der Welt haben heit bitter gewähnt und bewähnt die vier kleine schwarze Mädelach, hob ich auf dem Rovs Kaddish geantwert, Omein. Uh, so he's, you know, he then goes on to talk about his orphans, 
who are, you know, these, uh, you know, these, these orphans from the Holocaust and the kind of collective Kaddish that's being said. And I find it striking that he opens the entire poem, this is the beginning of the poem, with not just with the, the word Kaddish, the name of the Kaddish prayer, which is the prayer for the dead, but with the opening Aramaic lines from Kaddish. He, he finds his way in. And there were others that were also writing Kaddish poems in commemoration of Holocaust victims at the time. He's trying to find a way to continue to gesture outward, even as he marks the, uh, the genocide that had taken place in Europe. Yeah, it's, it's really a striking and, and beautiful poem. Um, first of all, this image of, of solidarity through Kaddish, you know, one of the Ashkenazic traditions is that all mourners say it together. Um, but also this, this doctrinaire devoted communist, it's a big deal for him to say amen, you know, and he, and he says it in that poem, but, but this, this statement that he's making, which is ultimately, um, you know, that effort, that, that reach toward empathy uh, is, is perhaps the most important thing. Um, Yes. It's, it's a long time after, after all of the traumas um, that he's lived through and written about have, have happened, but still that emotional gesture is so important. And it also enables him to recognize that even though the sort of um, particular Jewish traumas seem to have ended in his context, there are ongoing traumas that kind of um, the recognition of which can maybe draw our attention back to that initial moment of solidarity before that major Jewish trauma, um, that, that moment of internationalism that your book is about. Yes, yes. And the civil rights era was a moment when there was a bit of a, re a return to writing in this internationalist vein. The common turn was long gone. I mean, you had the, you know, other kind of later, uh, um, internationalist projects that were uh, centered in the Soviet Union, but um, the, the civil rights era was a time when uh, it was almost a renewal of this, you know, return to Jewish trauma and application of that trauma to uh, the suffering of other groups, which had taken place in the wake of the pogroms in the 1930s. Um, well, there's a lot more to talk about, but I, I think we've been asked to, to limit our discussion to a, about as long as it's, as it's taken us so far. Um, so I think here would be a good place to stop. Um, like much of the, many of the poems um, that you talk about, sad with a measure of hopefulness and empathy. Um, so. so thank you so much for, for this discussion. It's just such a pleasure to talk with you about these things. Thank you, Amelia, for writing a really wonderful book that I learned a ton from. Um, and I, I wish we would have had time for us to talk about everything that, uh, that I put tabs in the book to, to, to mark down, but everybody should be encouraged to purchase a beautiful book um, with, with so many moving um, analyses in it. Thank you, Amelia. Thank you so much.